And so we carry on today with messages from Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 1 to 13. My brother Danny is with us. He's going to read them to us. Thank you very much. Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 13, page 1203, page 1203 in the Blue Church Bible. Um, that would be fine. Is it, is it on? I don't think it's on, though, is it? Oh, it is. Oh, no, it is. Oh, sorry. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> okay. Uh, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he, he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not Harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their own works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Christmas and rest. Christmas and rest. Are you sure? Some of you are thinking, don't you mean Christmas and stress? Poor old Santa. Christmas and rest. Or this, from America. When holiday stress hits you all at once. Christmas holiday, that is. And then on the right-hand side, you probably can't see the, the uh, caption there. I'm already in the holiday mood, she says to him. Stressed, broke, and exhausted. <laughs> Christmas for a lot of folks is is a stressful time, isn't it? Expensive, exhausting. It's a difficult time for us. In the Independent, a couple of years ago, how to cope with Christmas stress began this way. We often think of Christmas as a time of joy and happiness, but for some people, this time of year is stressful and unforgiving. Christmas has even been linked to an increased risk of heart attack, possibly due to the yearly pressure and emotional distress that often accompany Christian, uh, Christmas gatherings. There are many reasons why people find Christmas stressful, including pressure to find the perfect gift to give someone, pressure to have the perfect family gathering, and financial worries on top of all of that. Well, here we are reading a passage about rest. We've mentioned words of rest in Matthew 11. Come to me, says Jesus, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your souls. This chapter, chapter 4, mentions rest 
nine times in those 11, 13 verses. Nine times. And opens with these words. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. Wouldn't it be wonderful to find rest? Even at Christmas time. And at all times. Rest, rest. So this morning, we're going to, if I may use this word, ransack this passage. I mean, get as much as we can out of it. To see what is being said to us here about rest, which we so desperately need. We're so restless. Even when we're relatively rested in life, even when life is fairly smooth and easygoing, we can still be very restless inside. Well, what does this say to us about rest? And what if we actually tasted some of that rest for ourselves? The Word of God is unique in this sense. Um, it's there, isn't it, in those final two verses that Danny read to us? It's alive and active. It, it does what it says on the tin. Like, that's the expression, isn't it? It does what it says. And sometimes when we read God's Word to us, they're not just, just giving us an idea of rest or salvation, they're actually saving us. God is using them as his instrument to save us. And what if he used these words as an instrument, his double-edged sword, to penetrate and to give us rest? Maybe to, to hurt in order to heal like the surgeon's knife. Well, firstly, let's notice that this rest that he's talking about is not merely the rest of a place or a situation or a circumstance. Uh, verse 8 tells us that, doesn't it? Because he speaks about Joshua. Uh, uh, brought the people finally into the promised land. The land of milk and honey, the land of Canaan. But he says very clearly, doesn't he, that if Joshua had given them rest, if, if this was, if that was, ultimate rest, th then they would have landed. That would have been it, wouldn't it? They would have found the rest in a place, in a circumstance, in a location. So he's speaking about something deeper at rest than simply the rest of peaceful circumstances or calm places. We could call it a spiritual rest, a rest of soul, mind and heart. Uh, and it struck me, and, and uh, Andy really helped me in, in the week as we were having conversation about this, that we, we can think here, I think to some extent, although we'll come very much back to ourselves, about the present dreadful conflict in Israel. These words may have some application to that. We live in a borough, don't we, that seems very largely biased towards Palestinians. In the schools and on the streets, you've seen all the flags all over the borough. I've lost kind of how many I've seen. And perhaps our temptation is to go the other way and to, to give our wholesale support to the Israelis. But as we come to, to passages like this, we remember, don't we, that the land of Canaan, now Israel, was never the final rest. It was never the, the fulfillment of the promise, the final fulfillment of the promise. That the rest that God offers, the salvation that he brings, is not something territorial. And therefore, <clears throat> I think many of you would agree with me, take sides. We're not called to take sides. But to hope and pray for both Jew and Palestinian, not only to come to some temporary political peace, but to come to the one who alone can provide rest for their souls. A, a rest which will then ripple throughout their families and relationships and out into their society. A rest that, that calls us to live at peace as far as it is possible for us to do so. A rest that impresses upon us the great message of reconciliation in the gospel. And even of loving enemies and persecutors. If, if, if that rest, if that message gets under the skin of anyone, it begins to affect their whole lives. And for us here and now, 
like I said, this, or this rest is more than merely restful places or circumstances. And that's great, isn't it? Because our circumstances, and I know many of your circumstances, are not always peaceful. They're not always pleasant. And on the flip side of that, even in peaceful circumstances, we find, I find personally, that our hearts can still be full of trouble. Our minds can still be working on something anxiously. I'm sure none of us would pa pass up a week or two in the Bahamas right now, but as likely as not, we take our worries with us, right? We wouldn't leave them behind in the UK. And so we find that we do need a spiritual rest. We need a deep rest in our souls, in our hearts and minds. Not just a physical kind. Uh, by, by all means, give me a, a week in the Bahamas for my Christmas present. But I would take my worries with me, I have to, uh, I have to confess. This is a deep arrest, isn't it? It's a, re a rest rooted in our relationship with God. Peace with God. Forgiveness of every sin. Hope of eternal life. Full salvation. This is the rest that is on the table for us here. You see, there is a restlessness inside us that comes from being out of relationship with God. He is the God who made us. There's a nagging feeling at the back of our minds. Not always, but sometimes it leaps up, sometimes in moments of, of trouble or distress or bereavement. Very often, as you lose somebody you love, you, you, you begin to think about your relationship with God. You begin to think about ultimate things. I've seen that many times. I remember a guy coming to me years ago. I didn't really make full use of it, as I should have done. I kind of regret that, but he, he was very, he, a friend had died. He'd come to the funeral, and he was really troubled about his eternal security, about, about his relationship with God. You have made us for yourself, as a man prayed many years ago. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Have you found rest in the one who made you for himself? So that's the first thing. It's, it's a spiritual kind of rest. It's a rest in our relationship with God. It's peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Second, it's not just rest. It's, well, you know, you know the advert, I'm sure. This is not just chocolate cake. This is Marks and Spencer's chocolate cake. That means it's the very best. It's the premium. It's the ultimate chocolate cake you could ever experience. Well, this is not just rest. This is not any old rest. This is God's rest. And we're told that at, at, at least four times in this passage. Verse 1, his rest. Verses 3 and 5, God speaking, he says, this is my rest. And verse 10, God's rest. Four times we're told that this is a particular quality of rest, the highest quality, the rest of God himself, the Almighty, the Lord over all. And we can only imagine, can't we, the, the, the deep harmony and, and sort of integration and uh, shalom peace that is within God himself. Can you imagine how great that peace must be with, within him? The stillness, the calm. I looked up that word shalom again this morning, went to a, 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 to the Messianic, a, a Christian but a Jewish website. That word is a lovely word. So most, some folks will tell you more about it here than I can, but it means so much more than just the absence of noise or, or trouble or conflict. It, it's a really positive sense of well-being, of being well, being whole. Beautiful word. And that is the peace of God, isn't it? That is the rest that is here for us. It is whole peace, that lovely well-being. Third, it's also called Sabbath rest, isn't it? Verse 9. Many of you have, have loved the Sabbath or even the, the, uh, the British Sunday. And of course, the Sabbath was a beautiful sign of the rest of God who rested on that seventh day after creation. The purpose of that Sabbath was rest. Again, I've looked up that word, 
Shabbat. Or it's a word that means uh, cease or stop or even sit. Sit down. Stop. Stop, says the Lord. All the busyness, all the business and all the busyness, all the striving and stress, all the fussing and fretting. Press the pause button. Stop. Be still. As we come into the New Testament, we find that the Sabbath was a beautiful picture. Indeed, a shadow, it says, in Colossians chapter 2. The Sabbath day was a shadow of Jesus and the salvation and rest that was coming in Him. The one who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, rest is not found simply in a regulation or a rule. It's found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Come to me, he says. I will give you rest. Not do this or that. Not follow these four or five points. You know, you can read plenty of articles online about how to find rest or relaxation. Mindfulness. Diet. The diet. Your diet is important. Your exercise, make sure you get plenty of that, and so on and so forth. Jesus says it's not in the end, it's not ultimately about regulations, about guidelines, about rules. It's about coming to Jesus. It's about a relationship with him. Fourthly, as I look at down through the passage, I find that this rest is a particular kind of rest in verse 10. It's a rest from our own works. Did you notice that? Uh, anyone who re enters God's rest, verse 10, also rests from their works, just as God did from His. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to rest from your own works? Well, I notice that it doesn't say work. It, this, is, this isn't where you take a, a long holiday and never have to go to work again, or, d or do anything, any kind of activity. That's not what's being spoken of here. It's a particular kind of work that is being spoken of. And works here refers to attempts to get ourselves right with God. To get ourselves God's good books. Whether through helping at night shelter, or helping a lot of old ladies over the road, or saying your prayers, or, or coming to church from time to time, or whatever. All of those things that we think might give us currency with God. The Bible is very, very clear, isn't it? They, they don't. That's, that's never going to cut the ice with God. We're just too far gone. We're too corrupt. We need a, a, a radical salvation. So works refers to those attempts. Now if I said to you, here's a little test. Don't answer now. If I said to you, do you think when you die you will go to heaven? And you, Maybe you'll say, yes, I think I will. And I say, well, why do you think? We'll say, I think the instinctive answer of a whole lot of people out on the street, maybe even a few in here, I don't know, would be, well, I've, I've, I think I've lived a decent life. You know, I've done what I could and um, I haven't been perfect. I'm, nobody's perfect, right? But I've lived a decent life, so I think the Lord will let me in. You see, that, that, that's completely not the answer the Bible gives. There's no hope in ourselves. The only hope is in Jesus Christ. And so becoming a Christian means that we abandon all hope in ourselves in terms of our relationship with God and our everlasting hope. We abandon all hope in ourselves. And that takes humility. And I think that's where a lot of us come unstuck, isn't it? That moment of humility where we bow down before the Lord. Lord, have mercy upon me. I'm a sinner. I need you to cover all my sins. I can't make it myself into your presence, into heaven. We admit that we need charity. Are we too proud to accept the charity of God, the grace of God? Because this rest is rest from our own works, our own attempts to get right with God, our own attempts to impress Him. Let's give up on those. The only way is through faith in Jesus Christ. I notice too that it's available for anyone, verse 10. There's that lovely word, I see it often in the scriptures, anyone. That is to say the, the gospel is offered to everyone and anyone. 
who wants it, who truly wants it, who will really take hold of it. So if you're rich or poor, old or young, nice or not so nice, cool or uncool, um, whoever you are, it is offered to you to come to enter into this rest. But more particularly, particularly it is for those who have faith, verse 2, or for those who believe, verse 3. Did you notice those words in verses 2 and 3? Well, apologies uh, for those who have lost the last few points. I've been saying that this is a particular kind of rest. It is not merely the rest of a place or situation. It is the rest of God himself. It is called Sabbath rest, that beautiful sign of uh, true uh, peace and shalom. It is a rest from our own works, our own attempts to get ourselves right with God. And that takes humility. But fifth, I'm saying it, it is available for anyone, anyone at all, and more particularly for those who have faith, verse 2, believe. And I want to speak again about the kind of faith or belief that is in view here. We, we touched on this last week. Perhaps we did more than touch on it because we noted two other words used in chapter 3. I wonder if you remember what they were for faith or belief. And one was confidence and the other was conviction. And these are great words to use for, for faith, confidence and conviction. Faith and belief can be a bit flaky in our language, but confidence and conviction are strong, aren't they? Someone's helpfully shown the difference between a mere belief and a conviction. They've said this, a belief is what you hold, but a conviction is what holds you. In other words, a conviction is something that is such a strong belief that it, it holds you, it motivates you, it drives you, it shapes your life. You could call it just a strong belief. And we may also have noticed a connection that is being made across these chapters, but particularly 3 and 4, between faith and obedience. Between faith and obedience, or unbelief, non-faith, and disobedience. They're, they're interconnected in these chapters. You'll, you'll see it all over in these two chapters in particular. So this is the kind of faith we're talking about here that drives or motivates or inspires obedience to Christ. In other words, that makes a difference in your lifestyle. Now, we're not saved. We're not, we don't enter this rest through obedience, but by faith, by faith alone. But it's the kind of faith, we'll see this as we go into Romans in the new year, it's the kind of faith that motivates obedience, that, that comes with obedience. That is to say that we follow Jesus, that we change our lifestyles. Another way of saying it is simply this way, a person who believes in Jesus, truly believes in him, also follows Jesus. But if you say, I believe in Jesus and I trust in Jesus, but all it means is that I get a bit of comfort from my faith, but it never really challenges or changes your lifestyle, that's not the kind of faith we're talking. That's not a saving faith. You know, in, in, in the area of our relationships, for example, it, it, would, it would impact upon that. I heard of a couple who were living together, not married, but in a sexual relationship. They, they came to believe in Jesus. They reckoned and realized it was wrong according to Jesus, and so they stopped living together. That's a, a moment of obedience, isn't it? That's even a costly obedience. But it's the kind of faith that is so strong, they believed in Jesus so strongly, they were willing to take that step of costly obedience. But not just in the area of sexual purity, also in the areas of generosity and kindness and service. It should impact our lives. It should make us different from our neighbors if we don't believe in Jesus. It should show up in our lives in act of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, such faith as this, this conviction, this confidence, so hears the Word of God, verses 12 and 13, the alive, active Word of God, that when we, we really hear it, and many of you have had this experience, we are cut to the heart. The double-edged sword goes in. It penetrates. We are cut to the heart. You know, I've, I've sat in meetings where I've felt cut to the heart. I remember one, an outdoors meeting years ago, Luis Palau, an Argentinian um, kind of Billy Graham 
of his, of his day. I think he died quite recently. I was just rooted. I was cut to the heart by what he was saying. I felt guilty. I, I felt I needed Jesus. And it's when we are cut to the heart about our shame and brokenness, and we throw ourselves into his arms and on his mercy, there is that moment, isn't there, where we feel the sharp double-edged sword cutting right through us. But remember, folks, that this sharp double-edged sword, which really lays us bare and cuts us open and cuts right through into our hearts to show us what we really are, is a surgeon's knife. And a surgeon's knife is not designed to kill or hurt or maim. It is designed ultimately to heal. It cuts and it hurts in order to heal, as our friend Rolly here would, would tell you, and other uh, medical folks who may be here. R Rupa, too, sorry. <laughs> That's what the surgeon's knife is for. That's what the double-edged sword does. It hurts in order to heal. Such faith as this, such saving faith as we're talking of here, pays the most careful attention to the message, chapter 2, verse 1. Fixes our eyes on Jesus, chapter 3, verse 1. Truly believes and embraces the good news, chapter 4. And trusts deeply in Jesus as our only hope in life and death. That is the kind of faith that is able to enter into the rest of God. Hebrews 4, verse 11. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Now, you read that and you say, well, wait a minute. You just said that we don't have to work for this. It's there in verse 10. In fact, it's the very verse just before. How does that work? Anyone who enters God's rest, verse 10, also rests from their own. We don't have to work for salvation. Let us then make every effort well, that sounds like work, doesn't it? Every effort. An effort is a work. It sounds like a contradiction. It's not. Uh, what is it we are to work on? What is it we are to work on in verse 11? What is it we are to strive for in some translations? Strive for or make every effort? Believing. That is the work we are to do. Believing. Jesus once said the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent, the work that he requires of you and me is first and foremost to believe, to trust with this saving faith, with this conviction, with this confidence. That is what we are called to do. As you hear the voice of God in these words, do not harden your hearts. My brother made a, a good emphasis on those words I thought earlier. Do not harden your hearts with resistance, but soften your hearts. And open your hearts to his message of mercy, love, and rest. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. For he alone, as we've seen in the earlier chapters, is worthy of such confidence. He has done everything necessary to secure salvation and rest for anyone who will come to him. His work on the cross is complete it is, as we'll see, as we would see if we went right through Hebrews, absolutely watertight. It can bring us full forgiveness. It can draw us into the presence of God. It can bring us peace with God. The sure hope of eternal life. And you can rest full weight on Jesus Christ forever. Like you can with no one else. Remember the everlasting arms? From last week, underneath are the everlasting arms. Every other pair of arms will fail you because people will die. Or money you, won't, you can't take it with you. you can't, those aren't everlasting arms. Not even your loved ones, your closest, your nearest and dearest. But these are everlasting arms that will never fail you. You can rest on these arms forever. Well, how wonderful it would be to taste something of that rest this morning. Many of you are stressed and tired and looking for just a little bit of rest and refreshment. To taste again that peace with God, that peace of, of knowing Him, resting on those everlasting arms. Perhaps today you can find some time, take some time, some time to 
to rest and revel in him and all his love and promises and grace. But just a final thought, and it's, it's a warning, because really we have, we have warnings in these two chapters. It's red lights that come out to us from the passages here. The gist in chapters 3 and 4 is that these are warnings from Psalm 95. Do not harden your hearts. Do not perish in unbelief. Don't lose out, it's saying to us, on the rest that God has provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it calls upon us not only to think about what we might lose, but what we might get that. And that word perish is a, is, a, is a scary word, really. Perish is a scary word. Remember, remember chapter 3, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? I've been thinking about death quite a lot lately for obvious reasons and what happens when you die. And how somebody dies, well at least now they're at rest or rest in peace. Their troubles are over. But they're not at rest. What if they're not at rest? Because they've never received the rest of God in their lifetime faith in Jesus Christ, because they've ignored such a great salvation. According to the Lord Jesus Christ, more than anyone in the Bible or indeed in history, hell is a reality. It's very real. And it's a very real danger for those who will not embrace him with faith, confidence, conviction. Well, may the Lord... Have mercy upon us all. And may the Lord give us grace to receive his rest now and forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what, what wonderful rest you have provided in our Lord Jesus Christ and in the finished work of Christ on the cross. All done, all finished as we receive him as we bow to worship, as we embrace him by faith with conviction and confidence. Oh, may we know this rest, even today and much more in the future when he comes again to bring true rest and shalom peace to all creation. May we be part of that new rest. And may we know that peace in our hearts today as we trust in him. Help us to then make every effort to enter that rest through confident, obedient faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name, amen.